Okay, good afternoon everyone. This is Chris at Western Region and we're going to go ahead and get started. I um, know that quite a few offices are being hit with some pretty major weather uh, today. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll definitely be recording this call and uh, post it on the SharePoint site uh, for later viewing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and quickly introduce uh, Jonathan Wolf up at uh, WFO Portland, Oregon. And he's going to be talking to us about the model spectrum tool that uh, both Portland and a handful of offices in the region have started looking at and using operationally. So um, without uh, further delay, I'll, uh, Jonathan, go ahead and take it away. All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, can you hear me all right? Everything sounds good? Yes. Yep. We're good to hear from region. Okay. So uh, let's see here. Doo -doo -doo. Um, first, I'll start off with an outline on the tool, kind of going through a little bit of an introduction. I'll go through a little bit of the uh, behind-the-scenes uh, work that goes on in the tool, how it's useful as a forecast tool, um, an interesting uh, feature that I found with the bias direction or the, the PC grid, and then also uh, hit on the limitations of the tool. So, so it all started with uh, my garden. Um, a while back, I, I'm kind of an avid gardener, and I like to uh, um, know when temperatures are going to get close to uh, freezing so I can take the plants in or cover them up and everything. And uh, I just I, I wanted a good way to find um, what the chances are or were for freezing temperatures, you know. So um, based on our current um, suite of products, we, I mean, we gave a forecast for a low temperature, but it really gave me a good feeling for is it could it go any lower. So I thought there's a little bit of a need there for um, at least my own interest, and I figured if I wanted it, there's probably other people who do too. So that's uh, one aspect of how it started. And the second one is um, being at work, typically with all the models that were, are coming online nowadays, it kind of becomes data overload. Um, this is just an example of a stock market tool that people develop. But as you can see, it's a, a very, very messy uh, um, example of a lot of data just um, that just becomes overwhelming, and you can't really pick out the stuff that you really want um, to see. So. Um, what I did was I kind of just went back to uh, probably some statistics I learned in college or something and just decided that maybe a, a box and whisker plot time series might be the best way to um, display the data. And then uh, so I developed the, the main interface for that, which is just the, uh, the, the plot portion. And then after a while I thought, well, it'd be kind of cool if you could map this and find out where these sites are, especially the ones that are a little more um, obscure and also use it more on the regional or national level. So I kind of went in and put it on a Google's map and uh, made the interface kind of all tied together um, from the first version I had. So um, that's the general interface. If uh, um, you ever need help, there's this little uh, question mark in the top right-hand corner that will go through how to read the graphs and basically what everything in it is and does. So. Um, without further ado, I'll kind of step through some of those uh, graphics that I have. So how to read the plot. Um, basically, your time starts on the left as the uh, current time and it goes out in the future towards the right. Um, there's a lot on here, but uh, the little brown dots at the very farthest left, the one that says observation, uh, that's what actually happened for the temperature. That's um, based on uh, what GFD thinks as uh, has occurred based on the RTMA analysis. So um, it's it's not exactly what happened, but it's what happened for that grid in the obfuscation program that all of us um, look at. So that kind of puts it on the same field as all the other points that we're using as forecast um, grids. So if you go on to the right, uh, you'll see different colors for the different box and whisker plots. Those colors uh, re are really just the standard deviation of the set of models that go into each point. Um, the lower the standard deviation, the more likely you are, you can, are going to see a green color, where if there's a lot of spread in the, uh, the sample, you're going to see more of the red colors. And I arbitrarily chose uh, thresholds for each one of the fields that are used here, um, just based on uh, trial and error here. So there's really... Um, no hard threshold. Those can be varied um, in the code, but I just, I just I know, these, these thresholds that I picked seem to work pretty well. Um, and then 
to get the box and whisker plots, I used the uh, 25th and 75th percentiles. So basically, um, half of the data falls within the inner um, thicker box, and the rest of it falls outside of that. And it also um, denotes outliers by um, the max and the min um, values by the, th those are the whiskers on the plot. Uh, another thing, if you look at the red plot, um, the one that has the high uncertainty in this case, um, there's a little gray line that you can see. That is the median value of all the samples for that specific time um, for that field and site. Um, and if you hover over any of the blue dots, which are our actual forecast values for that uh, field and site, um, you'll get more information about exactly what the NWS forecast is. In this case, it's 44 degrees. And it gives you a little bit of information on the model range and some um, general statistics about uh, the sample size. So for instance, this is way out there in day seven. There's six models at that time period. And so there's more information once you uh, play around with it. But um, that's the gist of the regular plot. The background colors, at least on temperatures, show the uh, climatological data, such as the record high, the normal high, the normal low, the record low. Um, if you hover over the point, you can find out uh, what years those records were set. And that all comes from the hydrometeorological database in AWIPS. There's another option I added, um, because some forecasters wanted to see, well, that's great seeing the current uh, set of um, box and whisker plots, but what was, how, how has it performed in the past? What are the trends of the model? So what I did was I took um, uh, basically an hour during the day to compile all of the data for that um, point, and uh, I just, every day I grabbed that whatever, basically a snapshot of the current models and our current forecast and save it to a Postgres database. And then later on, I go back and query that database and pull out our forecast for, um, in this case, you know, seven days ago is the, the gray bar that is furthest to the right. That's the model um, forecast, and those are just um, the inner bars. It doesn't, it's so basically the box inside of the, uh, the box and whisker plots. It doesn't have the, uh, the whiskers. Um, and then uh, the, the light blue dots are our forecast. So you can see how our forecast is trended over the left the last seven days compared to the model. And then in this instance, the brown dots on the far left are what actually happened. So you can see um, most of the time it's, it's fairly close. Um, but there are instances where they do deviate. Um, so here's another example in the newer interface where uh, the, the little um, brown dot is much colder than what our forecast and the model trends were. So it's not always the most reliable. Um, predictor, that little guy right there, falls way outside of the, the um, forecast and, um, yeah. So another uh, feature on there is you can show the data, data points and actually find out what all the different models are doing. And this is just a snapshot from minimum temperature for um, a site. And there's just a few, uh, few models there. But you can hover over each one of those um, models dots and find the exact value for that. Um, particular dot, and um, in the latest version, you can, if they're really clumped together, you can zoom in and find out the value for that dot. Um, so there's the regular map interface, which is really nice, because you can go anywhere and basically get the plot, but um, when you do use the Google interface, it's a little slower because you're panning around and you're loading all the Google background images, and it... Uh, kind of bogs down the system, so I added this extra little button here that'll just pop up um, a little window that uh, allows you to narrow it down by your WFO, um, three-letter ID, and then it displays all the sites in your WFO, and then you can click between those and um, get it without having to go through the um, higher-end Google interface, and it's a little quicker. Uh, the other advantage to this is if you're checking, like, the differences between um, sites, you, the, the map or anything doesn't pan, it's just all in that same window so you can see quick, um, a quick way to compare sites and uh, fields, especially the bias corrected stuff. So how does it all work? Uh, basically I run a seashell script in AWIPS. Uh, we do it here every hour, but you can do it as little or as much as you want. Um, the runtime for the script runs about 
half an hour, but it's really dependent upon how, upon how many models and how many sites you have in there. Um, but essentially, it, uh, once you run the script, it kicks off a GFE procedure. That procedure goes through uh, the GFE smart edited grids and pulls out all the data for the points that you specified in a configuration file um, within GFE. And then it makes a bunch of small little data files. Um, those data files are pushed to LDAD. And then from LDAD, they are synced to the Western Region web server. And once there, my program knows where to find them based on uh, another configuration file that's generated from the GFE procedure. So, and once they're on the web, um, I use uh, a library, a JavaScript library called Kooksdo and Slot to generate the plots in the interface. Uh, so that's the general data flow. So as far as uh, forecasting usefulness, um, what are some advantages to this? Well, first off, in this instance, this is a, a pop grid for Portland. Um, and I found that it's really handy, just uh, not so much um, as actual values, but the colors in the pop grids are really good at uh, identifying times where you're most likely to see precipitation. So in this instance, it's the red area. Anytime there's that, the models may differ slightly on the timing of front or the intensity, but uh, overall, that's kind of like your go-to period that you need to focus on for pop. So that first instance that I'm pointing to, um, our forecast is about 30% below the median for the model. So in that case, you know, maybe we're a little low there. Maybe we should boost it up a little bit. Um, so it kind of draws your attention to those areas where uh, we're outside of the models. And if we are outside of the models, is there a good reason that we should be? Um, so that's uh, an example. Here's another one for uh, freezing level. Um, there's that one just outlier grid. We kind of uh, make a trend down, or the freezing level is down earlier than the models do. So is there a good reason for that? It's something that you can uh, go check and uh, ensure, just to make sure our grids are the highest um, quality possible. Here's an example that we use a lot here. Um, does uh, the bias corrected grids help? Um, generally, they, they do a pretty good job at uh, minimizing the spread in the model. This is for the maximum RH, or relative humidity, uh, during um, the day or night, I guess. And uh, once you apply, this is exact same time period, same site and everything. And once you apply the bias correction, it takes all the spread from all the models and really um, tightens them up along a pretty, uh, pretty narrow line or fit. Um, which uh, probably give you a little more confidence in going towards that value compared to the top graph, which that bottom line, I think, is the European, which is much drier than the rest of the model. So that's probably the, a drier bias that the European model has for this particular point. And um, this kind of uh, leads you on to that, that bias. Um, some of the limitations. Uh, first off, it's a point-based um, uh, feature. So uh, you really don't get a good feel for what the surrounding data points are. However, I do, or I have been working on something that kind of uh, at least decreases that limitation. And so I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, the second limitation are the BC grids may be flawed. For example, this is a BC grid for our, I believe, minimum temperature. And you can see that weird um, line where there's a stark contrast between the 40 degree temperatures and the 50 degree three degree temperatures. And that, if your uh, site's right on that 53, and the actual temperature is really in the 40s, that definitely could uh, um, lead you astray. But that's something to be aware of. Um, the other thing is, uh, models and their smart units may not always be right. Uh, this, this is uh, actually kind of interesting, because a lot of offices have said that they've found errors in their smart units just by looking at the data that comes out of um, there and is displayed in this, this uh, interface. So for instance, this is a time in Portland where we had um, pretty cold temperatures, but the European was giving us uh, overnight lows in the uh, mid to upper 50s, when in reality, they were only in the 30s. And so I looked into that, and <laughs> it, was, uh, it was one of uh, the signs in the European smart unit was backwards. So once I switched it, it brought it down more into reality. Um, so we were adding when we should have been subtracting. So it's kind of useful in uh, doing that. 
another thing is uh, wind directions. Um, they're kind of messy when you plot them, and I mean, there's really no good way that I can think of to go about it. I did locally develop this other little piece of software that kind of puts all the models into a little box and whisker, not, not a box and whisker, but a time series plot and just kind of um, gives you all the wind directions and kind of spits them out. But overall, I mean, that's probably the best way to, that I can think of to show that data. But I don't know. It requires another tool, basically. Um, so like I said before, there's limitations on the point forecast. Here's what I've been working on lately is uh, you have that point forecast, which is 49 degrees in this uh, instance which is that little dot right um, in the middle of that purple area. Well, I thought maybe if I could sample the zone around that purple area, I could see a good distribution of what the temperatures are or what, whatever field you really want, what the distribution of the values are in that zone. And really it's just kind of concept that um, it's doable that you can basically take the zone and kind of compare it you know, quickly to what the actual point is. And right now I haven't completely decided on how I want to uh, proceed with this. Um, but right now, um, it's just using the forecast grids. And um, I haven't even released the version that does this yet, but I'm kind of looking for some feedback someday from this. So, um, But anyway, that's just kind of an example of how I could uh, um, counteract that limitation. Um, other uses are, it's, I think it's a good decision support tool. Um, you can relate the confidence in our forecast. You can show model trends. You may be able to show a very simple version in the weather story graphics and maybe put a good explanation with that of maybe a trend towards warm temperatures or a trend towards cooler temperatures or a very good or high probability of precipitation or high QPF during this one period. Um, for me, I found it very useful when the media calls and they're wanting to know what the high temperatures are and stuff. I can quickly have access to it for now and through the rest of the week and kind of tell them what our forecast is compared to it and kind of how the models have been trending. For it. And uh, finally, it's just a sanity check, just to make sure that if you are um, straying from the models, is there a good reason for it? And if there is, maybe you should uh, include that in your AFD. Uh, the setup to installation um, takes anywhere from five minutes to 45 minutes, perhaps longer. It really depends on what kind of skills you have. Um, but um, if you have only a few sites, it's probably going to take a lot shorter, because every site that you put in there needs to have a latitude and longitude value from the GFE grid, um, and then a couple other you know minor details. But um, it should be pretty straightforward. It's very well documented. Uh, there's a script that actually installs probably 95% of it for you. Um, as long as you know a little bit about GFE and smart tool modifications, um, that's really how you configure it. And um, the rest of the instructions should be straightforward. If you have any questions, you can always contact me. Um, there's been some question on uh, which version should I use. Uh, right now, the latest release is 3.1. It fixes a few of the bugs, like these purple graphs that happen when uh, your climate data has some bad values in it. For instance, this site right here had uh, record highs of um, 9999, which uh, basically takes the red and the purple values and just plots them to 10,000 and makes it purple. So. Um, so that's uh, one improvement you would have if you went to 3.1, because 3.0 doesn't have that. Another good improvement is in 3.1, you can zoom and you can, like on the right-hand picture here, um, you can zoom in and you can pan around and you can get um, much more detailed information if you want it, just with a, of the wheel um, button on your mouse. Just zooming in and out and clicking and dragging will make it pan. So I would suggest 3.1. I've been running it here locally for about six months without any problems. And there's a few other sites that have already come online with it. Um, and that's about all I have. I'll open it up for questions. I'm sure there's a lot of may have uh, posed more of them than I've actually answered. But um, we'll see. Hey, Jonathan. Yeah. This is Mel in, um, in Eureka. Can you go back to slide 18 where you have the distribution, the temperature distribution for that area? Sure. Have you considered, or, or just a thought came to mind when I was looking at it, that um, the idea of maybe a climatological distribution, I don't know if you could get something like that out of the prism data or by other means, but 
than some kind of a comparison against what you have here to what would be, say, a climatological distribution? No, I haven't considered it. Actually, I just thought about this idea about two weeks ago, and I just started kind of playing around with it. And so I just wanted to see, first of all, is it possible to kind of get a good feeling for what the points are around the area? But I think that's a, a great idea. I uh, just wanted to throw it out there. It just popped in my head as I was seeing this. And otherwise, uh, really nice work. This is very interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jonathan, this is Chris. Could you describe again, I guess I'm a little slow this afternoon, what's going on in this graph? What are the bar graph? What does that represent? Okay, so the bar graph in this instance is basically the distribution of points within that zone. Um, so, for instance, uh, the 49 degrees is one single point in that zone, the zone being that purple shaded area, which is, um, our zone seven, Oregon zone seven. And this is just all the values within that zone for our forecast grid. Okay, that, that makes more sense. I, I guess I didn't make that connection, but thanks. <laughs> Other questions, comments out there for Jonathan? Excellent briefing, by the way. Thank you. Hey, Jonathan, this is Dave in Monterey. Yeah. So we have, uh, I don't think we have this new version with Google Maps, although I see you have some of our sites on it. But we, we have a lot of trouble with this in the fact that more often than not, the data is missing for sites. And I don't know, we haven't really tracked that down. But have you had any other people tell you that it's kind of unstable? Um, no. Uh, as far as the data missing, is it, is it just old or is it just not there? Well, like today, when we look at San Jose, the y-axis on the plot has values from, like, 1,000 to 10,000, and all the data is plotted at the bottom. So obviously there must be some bad data or some something getting into the data. That is a result of running version 3.0, that little part that I talked about at the end. Uh -huh. Your climate data has values of 9999 in it. Uh -huh. If you update it to 3.1, those should all be fine. If, if you actually go to the bottom of the graph, this little uh, window will pop up with your forecast, but it's just being hidden because the scaling tries to scale to the zero to 10,000, and your values are, you know, right at the very, very bottom. Bottom, right, right. All hidden. Okay, so just get the newest version. That should fix it. All righty. Thanks. Mm -hmm. What's the URL for the Google Map version compared to the email that Chris sent out? Okay. Let's see. The Google, the Google Map one, just so you guys can write it down, is this one right here. Um, it's... Uh, dev.wrh.noaa.gov slash wrh slash ms slash build. And I do have a little thing where these are the sites that are running version 3.1. Um, uh, another difference in 3.1 is it cleans up the interface, at least on Google Maps, a little bit, so that when you zoom in, it actually adds more points. Uh, it's kind of just uh, basically I prioritize which points are more important, and the farther you zoom out, the less that are shown. So it doesn't clutter up the map and just make it a huge wall like uh, this version kind of is becoming. So. Have any other uh, questions or comments for Jonathan? Are you willing to add a few more sites to that Google map? Yeah, you can add as many as you want. Um, I would say maybe an upper limit, depending on how many models you have, would be about 20 to 25. Like, for instance, ours, I think our version, we run 25 points or so. Okay, so I, I guess I, I'm a little bit confused. Are you just generating... Um, data for your CWA, or are you producing all the sites we see on the Google map? I only, we only generate data for our CWA, so every site that wants to run it has to do um, their own um, setup. So, for instance, uh, up here in Montana, they have, and somebody down in Arizona has, and um, so any sites that generate the data, um, I, I see the data once it goes to the right place, and then I plot your site. Other map sheets. So once every once you have set it up so that your 
you're generating the data, it goes to a centralized location and then anybody can view it. Correct. Hey, Jonathan, this is Brett at the Riverton office, and I'm in Central Region. How did it go? Looks like you've got some sites outside of Western Region. How, how well did that do setting up and getting it to work? Yeah, um, for Central Region, there, there's a little bit of hoops to jump through because uh, we're treating this as like a regional application, and I just wanted to kind of do a concept to see if uh, we could get other regions to use it. Um, but uh, it looks like, um, or I, I can basically get it working because Bismarck up here is in Central Region. Um, but uh, like I said, there's there's some issues with uh, bandwidth and stuff. I mean, it doesn't use that much, but I, I could see if you know the entire country was using it and everyone was looking at it every second that you know that might be an issue. But uh, eventually, the web will be transitioned to NIDs, and that'll be a lot easier to incorporate data from everybody because everyone will be on the same server. Because right now I have to do basically a, a, a curl routine to pull the data back to Western Region to uh, display it. Um, and that's how I've got the other regions into it. But it's easy to set up. It's the same exact um, setup as we do. The only difference is you guys place the data in a slightly different directory. Um, you would have to do it in your um, kind of WFO's images directory on your uh, machine, because I guess that's the one thing Central Region um, said it's okay to put the data there. But if you went somewhere else, it's a little more complicated, because you have to do a regional request to make a new directory, which kind of gets hairy, so. Yeah, dealt with that before. But yeah, I mean, as long as you've got it running already for Bismarck, then I'd sure love to mimic the process and get it going for our area. Um, where do you have the code and the instructions that we can get? Yeah, the code is on the Smart Tool repository. Okay. If you just search Model Spectrum on there, um, look for version 3.1, and it should be there. And Jonathan, I think it's next week. You're doing a briefing for the Central Region FOs, right? Correct. Yep. I think it's next Monday, but I forget. Well. Or not next Monday, so I guess a week from Monday. Any other questions? Last chance? Okay. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, again, Jonathan, excellent job. Nice work. And uh, we'll post the recording on the uh, Western Region uh, SSC SharePoint site this afternoon. Hey, Chris. Yes. Hey, Todd. I'm, I'm here with Jonathan. Um, I'll, I'll invite folks, if they want to call him, uh, to get any clarification or more details. They're, they're welcome to. But uh, he's, he's going to be here uh, a limited amount of time because he's uh, gotten one of the uh, pilot project jobs in uh, Charleston, West Virginia. So he's leaving at the end of January. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap up the uh, the call. So thanks to everybody for joining. <laughs>